following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Let the waters bring forth creeping living soul. This is the title of the lecture related with the fifth day of Genesis, which is a continuation of the series of lectures that we are giving in relation with let us make Adam. So, as we were explaining in the previous uh, lecture about how the light, which is called Yehi, related with the uh, so you call Yehida, which bring about different type of lights in the transformation of that solar light that the planet does through plants, through animals, minerals, and human beings in order to shine in the universe with different levels of light that we find in the infinite when we look in the night, the stars. So, having in mind that light, which are we explained in previous lectures, is an energy that needs a substance in order to express itself in the space. We explained in the previous lecture that uh, that substance is called Akash in Sanskrit, which is a uh, very beautiful blue dark substance that is diluted in the space and which the book of Genesis call waters. We uh, explained that when we read about the waters of Genesis, these waters are not the liquid element that we find in this three-dimensional world, even though that H2O, water, that we find in a three-dimensional world is associated with Akash. But let us put in our mind that Akash, that water, is a substance. Uh, formless substance. That's why it is diluted in the infinite space. So we find that water 
everywhere. And that water contains the fire, the energy, that in Sanskrit is called prana. If we go down into the different graphics that we have, precisely the number nine, we find there the explanation of how that light that we call prana, or that is called prana in Sanskrit, is a cosmic energy, vibration, electric motion, light, and heat. Universal magnetism, life. Prana is a life that throbs in each atom and in each sun. Prana is the life of ether. The great life, in other words, prana is transformed into a cash. That substance that we are talking about that is precisely called water in Genesis. A marvelous divine intensive blue substance that fills the entire infinite space. And when it modifies, it becomes ether. The ether, when modifies, becomes statues. Marcus Samael on Beor states that the study of the vibration of the tatwas is indispensable. There uh, we have uh, that uh, graphic in the right where you find the seven chakras. We relate with these tatwas in our physicality and any physical body or any internal body. The seven chakras Counting them from the very bottom, which is the Muladhara Chakra, relates to Prithvi. Then the Shwaristana Chakra to Apas. The Manipura Chakra to Tejas. The Chakra Tiatira. Anahata. I'm just talking here about the churches of the Book of Revelation. Anahata uh, is related with uh, uh, Vayu, the tarwa of the air. Then we find Vishuddha, which is in the throat, related with Akash. Adi, which is the Ajna Chakra, and Anupalaka, which is related with the Sahasrara Chakra. When you see this, you have to understand that uh, these seven tatuas or vibrations of the ether, they vibrate in that substance that we are talking about that is called Akash. So, related with any planet in the universe, that Akash vibrates in the fourth dimension. <coughs> That's why uh, uh, when we see, for instance, our planet Earth in the space, we see it with a beautiful blue color. That blue color is related with that uh, Akash substance within which we find the seven tatuas vibrating uh, in the fourth dimension. These tatuas, when they crystallize in the physical dimension, the three-dimensional world, then they become what we call fire, air, water, earth, and also that other element that is called ether, that uh, you need uh, a lot of concentration in order to see them. When you see the mountains from afar, that blue vibration of the mountains is precisely that uh, ether or fifth element that is directly related with the fourth dimension. The other two uh, tatuas, Adi and Anupadaka, are very spiritual tatuas that also vibrate there in that the Gnostic learn how to divide or separate from his particular vital body, as we explain in the second day of Genesis, in order to have 
spiritual experiences, samadhis, in the internal world. So when we talk about these waters, we have to understand that these waters, as we said, crystallize in this three-dimensional world. But in the fourth dimension, these vibrations, or tattvas, contain within themselves different elementals, souls, type of consciousness that uh, are mentioned in many religions. For instance, the elementals of the earth are called gnomes and pygmies. The elementals of water are called uh, mermaids. The elementals of the fire, salamanders. The elementals of the air are the sylphs and sylphids. Above them, of course, we have the akash, which elementals are called pundas. And the vibrate that you see in the throat. Above, of course, we have Adi and Anupadaka tattvas related with a superior type of consciousness that the Bible explains beautifully in the book of Ezekiel. If we go back to the first uh, graphic that we have in this uh, PDF, we find this beautiful picture of Raphael, or Raphael, this great painter, that show us what Ezekiel talk about in the first chapter of his book in the Old Testament, where we find the four creatures, or we will say the four type of consciousness related with the elements. And uh, we find, of course, what the Bible calls Hayot. The word Haya, as we explained in the previous lecture, relates with life. And this Haya relates, of course, with that type of life that vibrates in the Akash. And this is what we have to understand because Akash, the throat, Vishuddha Chakra, relates in the tree of life with that mysterious sephira called Da'at, which is knowledge. And we are going to explain the relationship with that and the water. So in Hebrew, the four creatures together are called Hayot, which is a plural of Haya. But Hayot implies a feminine plural. That's why we always, when we talk about the water, we point at the feminine aspect of God, that substance related with woman, related with the feminine aspect. Within it is the energy of the Father that we call prana or light. Because remember, when we talk about Elohim, God, we are addressing energy, light. It's not a person. Of course, in order to indicate that it's not just energy like the present uh, science of this world uh, is explained that everything is just coming from, from an explosion and that is they are looking for what they call the intelligent design where that intelligent design is everywhere because it is called intelligence. And those people that deny that this intelligence exists, they are calling themselves stupid. Because that intelligence is the one that is forcing them to look for it. That intelligence is here in, in us. If it's inside of us, it could be also outside. That intelligence is precisely what the Bible calls bina, which means intelligence or understanding, comprehension. And that's what we are addressing here we add, when we address the waters. So you see 
that this Hayot that Ezekiel addresses are really the four lower vibrations of what we call tatuas. Vayu is the eagle, Pritvi is the, uh, the ox, the lion is Texas, and the angel is, of course, Apas. Water is always related with, uh, with Adam or the angel in different symbols. So they are, of course, floating in the Akash, which is that substance that we are talking about where we call water. And of course, above it, we find that what Ezekiel says, we saw somebody like the Son of Man that were above the creatures. Of course, that relates to the superior. When we talk about always about the Trinity, about God, Elohim, we always talk about the throat above. In the throat, we have that that we call Haya, or Hai, that soul that is also in the universe, which is the Akash, diluted in the universe. But above it, we find that soul that we call Yehida. And that Yehida is precisely the divine light of the absolute abstract space that expresses itself to the water. And that, that, that's why it's above the Tadwas, the four inferior Tadwas, you know, related to the throat above. This is how we had to see it. Those are, of course, uh, 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 that duality is represented by the two cherubim that you find there that are holding the arms of the Ancient of Days. That uh, whole uh, picture is called in Hebrew Hayot HaKadosh, which means the holy creatures. Kadosh is holy in, in Hebrew. So in the evocation of Solomon, we said, Hayot HaKadosh, cry, speak, roar, bellow. Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh. Because relate, of course, to the upper triangle that we call Elohim, God in English. So, that's why when you read the first uh, verses of that uh, chapter related with the fifth day of Genesis, you find that God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly, creeping, living soul, and we wrote between parentheses, in ma and fall, causal body in me which symbolizes, of course, the masculine aspect of the water, because ma is feminine and me is masculine. That may fly above the earth, which is Malkut, the physical, three-dimensional world, in the open firmament of Hamayim, or Ha-Shamim, the heavens. When we talk about the firmament, we talk about, of course, as you know, three types of firmaments or spaces. Because this uh, physical world is called Asia in Kabbalah. But above it, we find Yetzirah, Bria, and Atziluth. Three spaces or three firmaments, which relate, of course, with these creatures. Because the tatwas vibrate in every dimension. You find them everywhere. Are the source of the elements in any planet of the universe. So let us study in order for you to comprehend better <coughs> what this uh, creeping living soul, which is in... in 
in Hebrew is nefesh haya. It's telling us. You see the, same, the second word here, haya, relate to that water that we are talking about, which is the akash, haya. So, the word, the waters, in uh, Hebrew, is ha-mayim. This is how you read it. Ha-mayim. The letter he means the, and then the letter mem, yod and mem, means water. The waters. It's a plural ending. So, of course, it's talking about those type of waters called akash, whether they are in the universe, above, in the space, around any planet, or around our physicality. That type of aura that we say that we see psychologically, psych when we are very psychic, around the, the body, that light contains that akash that we are talking about. And that akash contains the light. So, the word ha-maim contains four letters. The letter mem has the value of 40. Two times 40 is 80. Then we have the letter yod in the middle of the two mems, final mem and normal mem. And that yod has the value of 10, which makes the addition of 90. And finally, we have the letter he, which the value of it is 5. So we have 95 which is reduced to 14, Kabbalistically. So the waters in Kabbalah are the Arcanum 14 in the Torah or in the Tarot. 14 point as the letter Nun. The Hebrew letter Nun is the N. If you know about the tarot, you know that the Arcanum 14 appears an angel with two vessels of water and he is combining the two waters. It's called temperance. This angel, of course, is mixing two waters, the waters of Genesis. And of course, when they are uh, mixing this, what they are doing is mixing the substance and what is within the waters. What is what we find in the waters? We find the nun. Nun in Aramaic means fish. So you see how everything is related? So when we are mixing the waters, we are mixing the fish, the forces of the water. The fish, of course, in the human organism is associated with the sperm and the ovum, masculine and feminine forces with which we create life. Because the waters of Genesis in the physical body are the sexual energy, the sexual, what we call semen, masculine and feminine semen. And within those waters are floating the noon, the fish, the sperm, and the oven. And when we read, let the waters bring forth abundantly creeping living soul, well, what we have to imagine in the human level is a man and a woman performing the sexual act and mixing the fluids, the waters, within which we find the sperm and the ovum in order for a creeping living soul to come alive. 
So the book of Genesis talks about the creeping living soul. I am uh, sorry, but not that, not that much, to tell you that all of us are creeping living souls. So the water not only brings beautiful things, but also creeping. It's what the Sohar calls the Lilith. Because obviously, in this physical world, we find individuals that perform creeping sex. Beginning with fornication, adultery, and all those creeping type of sex that are very popular in this day and age, and that the creeping people worship. And of course, the outcome of those sexual relationships are all of this humanity, which is a creeping humanity, where we find, of course, nefesh, the animal soul, doing what is doing in this three-dimensional world. But as you see, all of that comes from the water. Because in Gnosticism, that liquid uh, uh, semen that we have is called liquid akash. The transformation of that substance, which is in the space, that enters through the elements into the physical body, transformed through the metabolism in the physical body into the fluids, creative fluids that circulate in an organism. And this is how we discover what the waters of Genesis are. So if you make more addition to the number 14 that is indicating the letter Nun, with which we write Nefesh, which is a word that means soul in Hebrew, but also we find Neshama Haya. The word Neshama also begins with Nun. And those souls, Nefesh and Neshama, are related with the human development that we're talking about. But there are other, other souls that we talk in other lectures that we are going to mention because Nefesh, the Arcanum 14, is reduced to 5. The number 5 is very deep in Kabbalah. Related with this lecture, relates to the five types of souls. The first type of soul is what we call Yehida, which is precisely that type of soul, or we talk in psychological terms, psyche, consciousness, intelligence, which is related with the abstract, absolute space and that manifest through the waters, we will call Haya. Haya. That we call also in Sanskrit Akash, which is precisely the water that we are talking about. This Haya is the consciousness of the Divine Mother and Yehida, the consciousness of what we call the Father. Listen, they are not people. We call it father and mother in order to point that they are the creators, the intelligence behind any galaxy, any solar system, any planet, any plant, any human being, any animal. So, the next soul that relates to the light of Yehida and Chaya is Neshama. Neshama indeed contains all the attributes of the light in the monad that we have. The monad is our own particular spirit. Each one of us has his own particular God, which is called El in Hebrew. 
that L, that is spirit, is precisely our own particular monad. What it means monad in Greek comes from monas, which means unity. In other words, we have within our own particular unity. That unity is what we call ruach. Our own spirit. The Bible said, and the spirit of God was moving upon the face of the waters. So that Ruach Elohim in Hebrew is precisely that spirit that we have. Every one of us has his own particular spirit. And within him is Neshama, which is precisely the spiritual soul that contains all the attributes that Yehida and Haya place in every human being. Every monad, we will say it better. Because if that monad works those archetypes which are in the Shama, then the human being, Adam, is the outcome of it. So every monad has that. But not all monads develop that. And this is where we have to understand. So Yehida is that universal consciousness diluted in the abstract, absolute space is light, is energy, is vibration, is prana. Haya is that blue substance that we call Akash diluted also in the space that contains Yehida. So Haya contains Yehida in a lower level. And after that, they, Yehida and Haya, project their image. That image is precisely what is placed in Neshama. <coughs> Remember that it is stated that Adam was made into the image of God. So that God is Yehida and Haya, diluted in the universe. But when it gives its attributes to the monad, that monad can make Adam. And that Ruach, Elohim, can make Adam according to that image. And that image, of course, is Neshama. But in order to do it, has to work in the very bottom. And then we find the very bottom, the last soul, which is called Nefesh. This Nefesh is called the animal soul. And this is what we find synthesized in the number five of the Arcanum 14, which relates to the letter Nun, the fish. Because the Bible states that the waters bring forth living souls into the surface of any planet, Hayot. And this is how we had to see it. So we disagree with the present science, science that say that the only planet that has life is this planet Earth, and probably all the planets will have it, because in order to have life, they need water. Well, it is good that they know that the water that they are talking about exists in different vibrations in different places, in the fourth dimension, in the fifth, in the sixth, and the seventh. The liquid that we find here, that we call H2O, water, is just the final outcome of all of these vibrations. So the universe in itself, the infinite, the galaxies, the solar systems, cannot exist without water. 
Because that water is the Akash. Is Ha Maim called in, in, in the Bible. This is how you, we understand it. When we apply that three dimensionally, multi dimensionally, then we understand what God is, masculine and feminine, and how it is present everywhere. In the spaces that in Kabbalah are synthesized in four, as we said it in the beginning. From the top, the first space is called Atiluth. The second space below Atiluth is called Bria. Below Bria is Yetzirah. And finally, Asia, the four. This four relates to the holy name of God, the Tetragrammaton. Yo, hey, vav, hey. Which the translators of the Bible translated as Jehovah. But Kabbalistically, we call it Yod Hava. So when we say Yod Hava, we embrace the whole universe. And we understand that it's also inside. Because this Tetragrammaton expresses it in many ways. In the universe. So this is how you understand how the waters relate to the five types of souls which are found everywhere in the space. In the second graphic, you find Matzah, which is precisely, according to Hinduism, the first avatar that appears, the first incarnation of Vishnu. It is good to remember that Vishnu in Hinduism is that God with multiple faces and forms related with the abstract absolute space. If we associate Vishnu with Yehida, then we understand that is light, consciousness. That's why Hohma, wisdom, related with Vishnu, which is consciousness, relates to that. And that's why in Hinduism is represented as the first manifestation of the water, of the Akash, Matsya. The first avatar, which relates to this lecture, because here's what the waters are bringing out. And of course, it says there, and Elohim created great tannins, and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their minam or minim. <clears throat> which in the Bible is translated as after the kind. Kind, in the Hebrew language, you find that the Bible says, min na minim, plural. The word min, which ends with the letter nun, mem, yad and nun, means sex. That's the right translation. It has other translation, of course, other meanings. But the word that, uh, or the translation that we want here is sex, because sex is precisely the creative force of God. And mina is also sex, or the sexual force. But ending with the letter mem final means plural. Their kinds. Meaning that according to their sexual force, is how these creatures appear. Huh? Tanin is a Hebrew word which means crocodile. And that we have to understand because really in the esoteric Kabbalah it is called crocodile the one that develops knowledge 
the one that develops the knowledge of Kabbalah in himself, in alchemy. Because this is alchemy. Transformation of the elements in you in order to develop knowledge. Kabbalah. So, the great crocodiles of Kabbalah are masters that emerge from the waters of alchemy. That is precisely what we call to be a master. Or in other words, what the Bible or what uh, in Hebrew is called rabbi, mm -hmm. master. To be a rabbi, to be a master, is to be a crocodile. I mean, you can receive the title in this physical world of a rabbi, but it doesn't mean that you are a crocodile. In order to be a crocodile, you have to know the meaning of the fifth day of Genesis in order for that mastery to emerge from their waters because mastery relates to the consciousness. And when we talk about consciousness, we talk about the five type of souls in Kabbalah. Nefesh, Ruach, Neshama, Haya, and Yehida. A type of consciousness that comes from the very bottom, which is called Nefesh, which is a sexual force that we have in the sperm and ovum. And from there, goes up in different levels, degrees, initiations, in order to finally to submerge within the infinite absolute space as Yehida. In the previous lecture, we talked about the different individuals that the Bible talked about in relation with the souls. Nefesh, we explained, relates to the King David. Ruach relates to Eliah, the prophet. Neshama relates to Moses. Haya relates to the two polarities, Adam and Eve. Remember, when we talk about Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve has different symbols that we explain in all the lectures. It's not just a man and a woman like ordinary people think. It has many symbols, Adam and Eve, positive and negative, masculine and feminine. And above it is Jehida, which relates to the Messiah. So in order for somebody to be a messiah, his monad has to be diluted into Yehida, which is what we call Christ in Greek, which is uh, another title for the same thing. That's why Master Jesus of Nazareth is called Jesus Christ. But not is because somebody thought that he deserved that title. It is because his inner being is diluted in Yehida. But not only he is diluted in Yehida. There are many other masters diluted within that light. Moses, for instance, is diluted in Yehida. But why is he represented Neshama? Because what is written in the book of Genesis relates to Neshama. And the one that gives that knowledge is Moses. In the East... There is a, a being that gives the knowledge related with the Buddha, the internal Buddha of each one of us, which is called Ruach in Hebrew. And the one that gives that knowledge is called Gautama Sakyamuni. That's why the Ruach in, the, in Buddhism is the Buddha Sakyamuni, the symbol of what in the Bible called Elijah. And of course, the difference between Master Jesus is that he has a very higher, very high type of consciousness of Yehida. And he came to the earth in order to teach the mystery of Yehida. And this is what his life talks about. What you read in the Gospels, is not just the physical life of Master Jesus of Nazareth, Master Averamento. No. What we find is the process of that light called Yehida through Nefesh, 
Because he, this is how he started. Remember that when he received the baptism in the waters, he emerges. And the Holy Spirit, etc., etc., enters into him, and he becomes the Messiah. That's a symbol that we have to perform with the waters in order to understand what Yehira, what the Messiah is. If Jesus comes 2,000 times and we don't perform this, it's just worthless. If Moses comes another time and thousand times to explain the same thing, it's worthless if we don't do it. Let us start thinking and understanding that it is not because we know this or because we read it or because we come from a family that studied that, that we are the chosen one. Because nobody is chosen one here, but only that one that chooses to practice what these masters taught in different religions. So therefore, as you see the word here, mina or minim, plural, you see very clear that the two mems are the first normal mem and the final mem in the word. And then, in the middle of the word, you find the letter nun, which we explained already, is a fish, the, the sexual force. Then the letter yod and the letter he, with which we write and we explain in the lectures, is me and ma. Me is who, ma is what. But me and, and ma relates to the positive and negative forces of the water within which we find the nun. Do you see the word there? So clearly, Kabbalistically seen. These two letters at the end, he and mem, means ma. The two letters in the beginning, mem and yod, is me. And between the two is the letter nun. And that means sex, kind. Isn't it wonderful? It is showing us very clear that the noon hides between the two waters. And of course, the one that appears there, according to Hinduism, is the first manifestation of Yehida, the first manifestation of Vishnu, which is called Matsya, which is the incarnation, uh, incarnated, uh, it is written as a fish. If we call that Moses, well, it won't commit any mistake. Because also Moses came from the waters, symbolically, Kabbalistically speaking. If we look at the next graphic, it says, number three, And Elohim created every winged fall after their kind. which the waters brought forth abundantly. This is what the fifth day of Genesis states. When you read that, this is how come the, the birds came from the water in the fifth day of Genesis. If you know Kabbalah, you know that the word fall in the Hebrew language means a winged, winged soul. And that refers, of course, to the angels. That's why when we were pointing at the beautiful painting of Raphael, we said that the angel belongs to the water. It relates to the symbol of water. And that's precisely how the angel emerges from the water. It doesn't mean that you will see angels coming from the waters, three-dimensional water. No, it means that you had to transmute your Akash. And your Akash, and within the Akash are all the Tatwas, all the forces. And when you reach the fifth day, which is the fifth initiation of Mayor Mysteries, then that winged fall, that bird, that angel, emerges from the waters within you. And that's precisely that. When I said this, 
You might say, well, from where you think that the angel had wings? And then I answer, from the caduceus of Mercury. Because the caduceus of Mercury had those wings of the spirit. And the two serpents, Ida and Gala, which are the duality of the water. Ida is the water and Pingala is the sun. But it is precisely the positive aspect of the water, or Yehira, the fire within the water. So when we transmute Ida Pingala, the two cords that we have in the spinal column, the wings will appear eventually and will appear precisely in the fifth initiation, in your soul. Because we are talking about soul. And when we are talking about soul, we are talking about Tifereth. The fifth sephira, from the bottom to the top. Tifereth is the human soul, the consciousness, the human consciousness. That's why the human consciousness emerges from the water. And the wings are precisely those elements related with the spinal column, with chastity, that allowed the individual that creates the causal body. The right to enter in any dimension. And to experience anything in any dimension with the causal body or body of willpower. Or, as the Bible says, men and women with good will. Do you hear that statement? Glory to God in the highest and to men of good will. People say, oh, it's the people that have good will that give charity. No, good will means causal body. No evil will. Evil will is the way in which you utilize the sexual energy in the very negative, degenerated manner. Good will is a causal body that emerges in the fifth day. And of course, when we state that the angels have wings, it's because personally I had many experiences with those beings. I invoke them and when they appear, they have wings. But not like the birds. Wings of fire, of energy, attached to their back, which means that they are chased. Because only those that are in chastity, develop those wings in the causal body, the goodwill. And this is how you see the picture here, the angel emerging from the waters of transmutation, the waters of alchemy, the mercury of the wise. So, by going into the next the fourth graphic here of this PDF, we quoted the second chapter of the book of Exodus, verse 1, 2, 9, and 10, which relates to Moses. It is written, And there went a man of the house of Levi, and took a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And the woman took the child and nursed it. And the child grew. And she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter. And he became her son. And she called his name Moses. Or Moshe. And she said, because I drew him out of the water, I call him Moses. The son of the Pharaoh, or the daughter of the Pharaoh, symbolizes the physicality, the physical body that we have. But the ones that create Moses, that we explain in many lectures, represents the causal body, or the goodwill that will that does the will of God is precisely created 
by the man of Levi and the woman, the daughter of Levi, meaning people that are in chastity, that know the mystery of alchemy. But Kabbalistically, the man of Levi is Yehida, and the woman of Levi is Haya. The two superior aspects that are working through the waters in order to put in activity Neshama, the archetypes related with a human being, with Adam, that in this case is Moses. And that's why you find this graphic. Me and Ma. Me is a man, Ma is a woman. But also relates, as we explain in the lectures, me to the cerebral spinal fluid, which is masculine, and Ma to the sexual fluid that is feminine in each body. But the two waters have to be connected in order for the noon to be active. In other words, the noon, which symbolizes the sperm and the ovum of two sexes. If a man wants a child, physically speaking, he needs to mix his fluids with the woman, and the woman also with the fluids of the man, in order for that noon, which is explained already, to emerge from between the two waters. But in the fifth day of Genesis, those two forces, waters, or fluids of our physical organism create Moses inside of us, the causal body, a body that belongs to the sixth dimension, which is above the astral and the mental body. The astral body, as we explain in the third day of Genesis, is the first unity that we create that relates to the Messiah, in each one of us. Then the second unity is a mental solar body. The other Messiah. The other solar body. The first astral body is called the Messiah, son of David. The second Messiah is called the Messiah, son of Joseph. To finally appear what we call Shiloh, which is a contraction of Shalom, Shalom, Solomon, the son of David, of course. You know that Solomon was the son of David. But is an explanation of what Moses is. Because Moses is a conjunction of all the forces in one. When Moses appears and goes to the father of all the lights, which is beyond the sixth dimension, he sees God face to face. Means in order to see God face to face, or that type of energy, that we call it the burning bush when he appears, and we explained that in the previous lecture. And then of course, we are in direct contact with our own particular God. Only Moses can do that. That's why in Kabbalah we state that before Moses appeared, two messiahs had to appear before. This is what the Zohar states. But we have to understand that alchemically speaking. In order to understand. Otherwise, as we explained in the previous lecture, we think that somebody will incarnate and we call the first messiah. And then the second, in order to appear the third, physically speaking. Which is what some dim-witted person think. He calls himself Moses, the reincarnation of Moses. And he explains that the previous messiahs or unities that appear before him are the master Samael and the other master or individual that appears after him. And he is the third that he calls himself Moses. When we understand Kabbalah, we don't are cheated easily. And we understand what is the meaning of it. Right, And when they don't fall into confusion. Because this confusion is not only about Moses. It's also about the angel Azazel. That we explained in the previous lecture. 
as a cell means the two polarities or archetypes that are identified with the negative aspect of the moon, which is Lilith and Nahema, that we have to purify. But it happens that it's a name of an angel that is called Azazel, that when he was physically alive, his name was Solomon. But now in this day and age, we find Azazel incarnated in four bodies. I don't know how, but this is precisely ludicrous. Because there is one as a cell that appears there that is also said that is Moses as well. There's another as a cell that appears there in another place in the internet, you find it. And even with his photo appears there, saying that he's as a cell. And another as a cell that I know. Internally, I found another disciple of the Master Samael that came to me and said, I'm going to unveil my inner name. And I asked him, what is your inner name? As a cell, he said, the fourth. And I said, listen, you have ego. You are confused. Analyze that. I don't care if you are or not the angel as a cell, because the master said that it's fallen. Could be you, could be the other one in South America, could be the other one there that appears from Mexico. I don't know. I don't care. Because that doesn't give me, doesn't take anything from me. But please, don't say it. Don't unveil that because then the Gnostics that are starting this doctrine will think all of us are ding-dongs, which are mentally sick because there are already three there that's stating that they are as a cell and you will be the fourth. They will be confused. They will think that this doctrine is just doctrine for fools, mythomaniacs. And this is precisely something that we had to inquire. This is what we were explaining in Australia. Because there were a lot of Gnostics in Australia. They were wondering about these incarnations. Which one is the true one? They say, I said, well, really, I said, I, I don't care. Because when you study the doctrine, you just developed and you are not identified with it. <clears throat> but what I feel sorry is not for me, but for people that are learning this doctrine. That's why I'm saying this in this lecture, in order for you not to identify, because we find also like four Moses incarnated. Not the one that was mentioned, it's another one, another one, three or four. And like why is appear different? Playing with the names of the angels, maybe dreaming that they are, but when we study this, we study what is that? Everyone has the capability of developing Moses within and as a cell within that relates to the fifth day. Because this is how in Kabbalah we study. They associate as a cell with Solomon and with Moses. But if we do not understand Kabbalah, we will think they are the, uh, different, I mean, the same soul. No. Inside of us, it's not related to the same archetype, alchemically speaking, Kabbalistically speaking. But outside, Master Moses is an immortal master. He's a superman. And he exists. As a cell, is another angel that unfortunately is fallen, but exists. In all of these, Individuals exist. So we don't, need, we don't need to doubt about it. But they represent archetypes in each one of us. And the master Jesus of Nazareth is a great master. He's a higher archetype that we have to incarnate. He represents that archetype inside. We have our own particular individual Jesus Christ. And this is something that we have to understand and comprehend. But outside there, in the Kalkian personalities, you find individuals that say that they are the reincarnation of Jesus Christ, the master that came 2,000 years ago. And uh, he talks to channelers, mediums. When you know Kabbalah and alchemy, you don't fall in those, those mistakes. But a lot of people that are looking for this doctrine and unfortunately fall into those cages of individuals that are just mythomaniacs. 
So let us not fall into that mistake and understand what Moses means. Moses emerges in the fifth initiation. That's why he said that he is born from the waters. We will say the waters of the fifth initiation of major mysteries. Because me and Ma, the waters, relate what we were explaining here. We find uh, in the next graphic No, this is frozen. And the next graphic, there, no, there, the one, well, there, we find precisely this beautiful picture of Moses floating in the waters as a crocodile. Remember that the Bible states that in a few days appeared the great tanins. This word tanin, together with levi, hides the word levi tanin, or what we call the leviathan. So the leviathan is precisely that element that emerges from us in the waters of sexuality relates to the power of Lucifer, sexual potency. And of course you know that the Leviathan emerges from the water and can go fly like a dragon above in the superior waters. Because when we talk about tanins or waters of Genesis, let us understand me and ma. Superior waters and inferior waters. The waters there, Akash, in the waters here in, in the physical world. And that is precisely what we call the Leviathan, which relates in the Zohar, says, who is the Leviathan? Oh, the Leviathan is Moses. And of course, when we study Kabbalah and alchemy, we understand very well that the Leviathan is Moses. But alchemically speaking, it's our causal body. That's the Leviathan. With the Leviathan, you can go and talk with the Father who is in secret, the Father of all the lights, with our causal body. And then you descend down and enter into your physicality. And there is the Leviathan talking about the commandments of God, the commands of God, the doctrine of God. So the Leviathan is, has the ability, the causal body, to be in this physical world and to be in the superior worlds. That is what in Sanskrit is called Bodhisattva. The Bodhisattva is the causal body that has within the mental and astral body. Within Misrahim, Egypt, the physical body. So are you read there in Genesis 1, 21? And Elohim created through me, the superior waters, the men of Levi, and through Ma, the inferior waters, the daughter of Levi. But relates, of course, as I said, to Yehida and Haya, the superior consciousness. Created <coughs> great tanins. Leviathans. By uniting Levi and Tanin, you find the Leviathan. And every living soul that moves, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their sexual force in the noon. She's the sexes, so after the me and my sexes. And every winged fall, the causal body, after their kind or sexes. And Elohim saw that Moses, which is a synthesis, all of that, was goodly. Or well, is what Exodus says, that the mother of Moses, when he saw Moses, is so goodly, so beautiful, so he hid it for three months. And this is precisely what an initiate does. 
when he's creating the, the causal body. He has to hide that because it's very precious body that we have within, that we allow us, and we work very hard in us. Because this Moses, remember, is that goodwill, good power of God that receives the commands of God and go into Egypt in order to liberate all the archetypes related with Neshama. That's why it is stated that Moses relates to Neshama because he is the one that collects all of that. Master Samael on Beor states, when all of the archetypes that we have within are making a unity within the human being, that is Moses. That is departing from the physical world where we find sin and degeneration, and departing from the Pharaoh and his army and all of that that we find in this physical world, and divides the waters from the waters. And he is ahead, and the rest of the archetypes are following him to the promised land, to the fourth dimension, where we find the rivers that purse milk and honey. That's the fourth dimension. You know what people think, that this holy land, the promised land, is in the Mediterranean. That's a symbol in order to point the fourth dimension. And of course, Moses takes all the archetypes, and that's why Moses is called in the PC Sophia, Moses Sabaoth. This word Sabaoth means army. The army of Moses are all the archetypes of Israel, elements of light that unites with Neshama, in order to make of that individual a superman. With the power of will, Moses moves the tatwas of the elements. Do you see how Moses is a synthesis of all the tatwas? Vayu, Apas, Pridvi, Tejas. A column of fire is between the physical world and the other archetypes or the Pharaoh and Israel. That's the Tarwa Tejas. It's dividing the waters, the Tarwa Apas. And he's walking in dry land, the Tarwa Pridvi. And he moves the air, of course. Tadwa Vayu. Thanks to the Ruach. Because the Spirit of God is also with him. And this is how we see how this causal body emerges from the waters. You find the uh, graphic number six. This beautiful graphic of the human being there behind the tree of life. When we talk about the tree of life, we talk about all those archetypes in synthesis. As we said, the ten sephiroth plus the three aspects of the absolute which in Kabbalah are called Ain, Ain Sof, and Ain Sof Or, make the 13 attributes of mercy that developed in the individual thanks to the activities of Moses. And it says there, Elohim blessed them, saying, Bear fruit. When we read in the Bible, it says, Be fruitful. And people think, Oh, it's talking about the animals that created from the waters. And of course, it's telling them to go and have children. But Kabbalistically, bear fruit means to develop the fruits of the tree of life. And the fruits of the tree of knowledge. That's to bear fruit. Each one of us has to bear fruit. But for that we have to fight. To be in chastity. To meditate. To free the archetypes of Israel. Inside of us. To create Moses. To develop that soul. 
that will allow us to go up in the sixth dimension without the fruits. What are those fruits? Are the five senses very well developed? Very sensitive, because we have to be physically hypersensitive. Plus the seven chakras that we talk about, which are related with the tatwas. Because remember that the senses also relate to the tatwas. The sight with the light, the smell, with the tatwa of the earth, tatwa of the water with the taste, the ear, tatwa of the air, by you. So we superactivate the five senses, the sense of touch, very related with uh, Akash. And with that, we develop the seven chakras. We have 12, the 12 fruits that relate to the 12 tribes of Israel or the 12 apostles that we talked previously in other lectures. And then you understand and comprehend this. But all of that develops in the throat, which is the Akash, the Vishuddha Chakra, which is the mystery of Samael on the or, our patriarch, our avatar that brought this knowledge. Why? Because Samael relates to the fifth chakra. Samael is the fifth spirit before the throne. You find, for instance, that in the Bible exist four Gospels. Why? Because those four Gospels relate to the four creatures, to the four Tadwas. Tadwa Prithvi, the earth, belongs to Luke. Tadwa Apas, the water, which is the Asod, belongs to Matthew. The Tadwa Tejas, which is fire, Hod, belongs to Mark. And the Tadwa Vayu, related with John, the Gospel of John, is the eagle. It's Vayu, the air. Those are the four Gospels, which are hiding the doctrine that we're explaining here. Hiding the Tadwas, hiding many things. But the only Tadwa that can explain that is a Tadwa that contains all of them, which is Akash which is related with Vishuddha. That's why Vishuddha relates to the At, the tree of good, of evil, tree of knowledge. And the one that unveils that mystery is Samael, because it belongs to him. The tree of knowledge is his own knowledge that synthesizes all the four Gospels. He explains that in his books. He says, I am delivering the fifth Gospel, which is the gospel of the waters of Akash, Bishura, the word, the logos. This fifth gospel unveils the other four. With the fifth gospel, we clarify the other four gospels. The other four Gospels are not only written in the Bible. There are many masters that came and that wrote their doctrine, but hidden in symbolisms, like in alchemy. Symbolisms of alchemy, symbolisms of Kabbalah, in all religions. So when you don't know the synthesis, which is Vishura, the Logos, the Akash, you read... And you can interpret that literally. But Samael is the clue, is the synthesis of all the Gospels. Because he's the fifth, he's the one that clarifies. When we explain this, I'm expressing my word, my logos, through my throat. And that is the substance of Samael that explains the other Gospels. That's why Gnosticism in this day and age relates to aqua areas. The water of the air, which is here, the Akash. These are the water in, in the superior forces. People are, that says, Samael only copy other books, 
other doctrines. And he made his books with other books. And we said, yes, that's the truth. Precisely because we are translating his books of Spanish into English. We don't ignore that. He put Paradise Lost of Milton and the books of other masters like Gurdjieff, etc., etc. He took it, but he didn't place it just like that. He took it, wrote it, and explained it. Unveil it. Because that is the fifth gospel. The unveiling of any secret doctrine. So when you develop that fifth chakra related with Akash, you see. Because here, this core clary audience or magic ear. The power of listening, of hearing the languages and interpreting them. It's not like people in this day think that the power of tongues is to talk gibberish. This is what they think. And they said, interpret, this is what they mean. No, this is, this is absurd. This is the power of the confusion of tongues, is what they have. But the power of tongue is precisely to read any book of esotericism, beginning with the Bible, and to interpret it, to unveil it, to take the truth, the light out of it. And is what Samael on the or did and is doing through the Gnostic movement. Unveiling. He has a power. Because Samael is another archetype that exists in each one of us. The fifth Christ, or fifth horn of the Lamb in the book of Revelation. Because the book of Revelation talks about seven Christs in synthesis, or seven mighty spirits. But Pisces Sophia goes even further. Pisces Sophia talks about 12 saviors, 12 messiahs. If you don't know Kabbalah, you think there will be 12 people. That's precisely the mistake. When you don't study and develop the Yeshura, if you want to develop this power of understanding any esoteric book, power of tongues, vocalize the sound E. E. And send the sound to your throat. That develops that power, that fruit of the tree of life that will give you access to understand and comprehend what we explain here according to our own level. There is a mantra that relates to the waters. In other words, with the mem, because we're talking about the water, we're talking about the mem. And here's the mantra. That mantra om and the symbol of om is universal, as you know, is the space. This is a symbol written aum, but you pronounce it om. And you see the M there? The O and the M relates to that universal cosmic consciousness. And after that you said, mm, again, related with the forces that you have in your waters, in your sexual force. Mm, the vowel or sound A relates to the memory of past lives or what the M created in past life, ma, by raising the thymus gland, ma. And the mantra is written, is written, I mean, money. The noon of money is the fish, as you know, we're explaining here. But we, the Gnostic, we transmute that. Therefore, we don't say money, we said ma, si. Because we take the fire from the sperm, from the ovum, and rise it to the spinal column in order to vibrate in the forehead, in the pineal gland. Ma si is how we pronounce the mantra money. Many Buddhists that uh, do not know this mystery uh, disappoint with us because it is not ma si, it's money. No, because money, because you don't transmute your sexual energy. But within us, we transmute 
So we don't say money, we said masi, because the S is fire that rises in the spinal column. And then you pronounce the third aspect of this mantra, which is in the throat. The letter P in Kabbalah is the power of the throat, the power of the word. Pa. And when you said ah, you are bringing the spirit of God through your mouth. Pa. Knowledge, the D, that, here in the throat. Mm -hmm. You see how this mantra works? Padme, the word expressing the wind and the power of the M through the throat, which is E, Padme. And all of that, you bring it and place it into yourself by pronouncing the mantra HUM, H. Or letter H is the sigh, <sighs> coming from your throat, from your vishura, <coughs> sending down to your solar plex, which vibrate with the U, who, and stabilize it in you with the mem again, who. <coughs> this is how we explain this mantra in relation with this lecture. In relation with the waters. Om Padme Hum. Pronounce that in that way and use your imagination as we explain it here, and you will see how the waters work with your consciousness, with your memories, with your Vishuddha chakra. And you, <coughs> that's why that mantra is advised by the Master Samael in one of his first books. In the Revolution of Belzebub, he says, Om Mani Padme Yom is the mantra that you have to vocalize every day in order to develop, because that mantra belongs to the throat, in this case, and many other chakras in, in your body. And this is how you put an activity all the light that we see there in that graphic, that we have because everybody has that light, but not everybody put it in activity. Let's go now into the seven, doesn't want to. Okay, here is the number seven graphic is what the Master Samael explains in his book, Revolutionary Psychology. And he says that Moses is the man, we put in parentheses, is the man of Neshama, the Adam of Neshama that collects all of that, who liberated the electric might of the willpower, which is Tifereth, possessed the gift of prodigies. This is known by the divine ones and the humans. So it is written. So, Moses, and you see in the graphic there, on the right side, by the way, you want to read about this, in the book of Revolutionary Psychology, it's written. So we, will want, we don't want to read it because it's, you can read it there. But in the right we find the, this beautiful painting, when you see Moses behind God. Or in other words, the causal body in front of the Logos, which of course is painted in that way in order for you to understand. This is the causal body. It says, Moses knew not that the or skin of his face horned while he talked with God. That's why uh, Moses was sculptured and painted with horns. Because the word that is written in Hebrew related with light or with horns is precisely that horn. But means that word means other things in, in Hebrew. But the thing is this. If you inquire, where does 
the horns of the gods appear because in the Nordic pantheon, you find gods wearing hats with horns. And you might think, oh, they like it, you know, because they were barbarians. No. Those horns exist, but it's a symbol, of course. One thing are the horns of the demons, which grow according to the evil that they perform in hell. But the horns of the gods are different, are on top of the head, relates to the light or the aura that emerges when you are defeating evil. When Lucifer, the carrier of the light, expresses itself through you. Understand that Lucifer means carrier of light. Do not associate Lucifer with Satan. Because Satan is that Lucifer, but fallen. We're talking about here the outcome of the transmutation of Yehida through Nefesh, through many initiations. And obviously, the light, the horns, will show that. Those horns give us objective reasoning. A type of reasoning that is not subjective, like the reasoning that we use in this three-dimensional world, the intellectual reasoning. Objective is beyond. It's something related with the soul, with the conscience, with neshama. When somebody reaches that level, develops objective reasoning. There are six, six degrees of objective reasoning among the gods, or among the angels, if you want among the masters. The one that develop the highest level is called anclad, which are those beings that are represented with the head of Sparrowhawk. Sparrowhawk. Which is a bird. So of course, according to the level of reasoning, is how they write, cabalistically and alchemically, their message. So those ray of lights that you see in Moses represent that light. So when he was explaining his Kabbalah, his knowledge at that time, through that people, the people were afraid. Don't be afraid of the light. In this day and age, we need to explain all of this, that we are explaining, delivering, free for everybody. If we were in another epoch, we will be burned alive in the fire. But now we are in the time of the end, and people need it. So when we deliver the light, of course, then you see the cheaters, the ones that are just exploiting humanity. But you know that the light is in you, and you have to develop it. And Moses is the one, willpower, that has to be born as a baby from the waters of chastity and little by little growing inside of you. That's why it's written, Moses was the only one, the only prophet that, that saw God face to face. And he's the only one that can do it. Only Moses. But that Moses is a bodhisattva, is the cause of the body, is a goodwill in us. He's the only one that can go and see God face to face and ask to God, what did I do? You did nothing yet. You need to work. You had to go to Egypt and to liberate Israel. Because when somebody reaches the fifth initiation, you think, oh, mastery, right? I am done. No. If you want to be done perfectly, 100%, you have to go back to Egypt and to liberate the part of your consciousness which is trapped and all your defects, vices, and errors that are controlled by the Pharaoh in the physical world. And that's what Moses do. Uh, do. And that's why when he comes down, his face is shining. And behold, as we explained in the other lecture, Ayin, Vav, Resh, means or skin but with Aleph in the beginning means light so meaning that his light when we talk about our own particular light physically speaking we are talking about or with a yin that light 
which is there in the space, is or with Aleph. So you have it there, that's why it's written that Moses showed through his or, his skin. This is how it's translated in, in Hebrew, skin. But it's the same light that every initiate develops because that light is a covering around your physicality and any internal body has that skin because any internal body has its own skin, his own light, which is contracted. And that's why it is written that when Aaron and the children of Israel saw Moses and the or, the aura, the light of his face, hornet, they were afraid to come near him. This is what people are in this day and age. When we explain the mysteries written in the Bible, they're afraid. They don't want to hear how Moses is the Leviathan, how Moses is Lucifer, the light, how everything is in relation with what we have to develop. People are afraid. Those people that are afraid are the failures. They go down into Klippoth to be liberated by the mechanicity of the moon. But when we perform the work that we are doing, we liberate the light willingly. That will is Moses in us. It's the body or the causal body that we developed. You find in the last uh, graphic, in the very bottom, the number 10, Moses there behind the burning bush. In the right side, we put the tree of life, which is the same burning bush. Because all the light of the four worlds, Asia, Yetzirah, Bria, and Atzilut, express to the burning bush. And of course, that's the mystery. The causal bodies is there, but in order to develop goodwill in the Atzirah, he has to go down. Because one thing is when the waters of Asia, which is the physicality, creates Moses inside of us. And then we said, we reach mastery. But remember that the man into the image of God was created in the sixth day, not in the fifth. Moses is there. But in order for that Moses to become the image of God as we see it after he descends from Sinai, is because he is in front of God and God said to him, you are going to take the direct path. You are not a will that will go into the spiral path, into nirvana. You have to work. Because I don't want of you a hasnamus. You are already born here as a master of the fifth day. But part of your consciousness is still in Egypt. But a lot. And I hear the voice of my people because are parts of me. And you have to go and liberate it because I want to be one with them. Because I am one. I am Yehida. And you have to be one with Yehida. So go down and liberate that. So Moses go down into Asia, which is called Mizrahim, Egypt. Liberate and go little by little into the world of Yehida. Into the wilderness. Performing the will of God. Reuniting all the forces. But remember that with him also come the creepy thin, the creeping souls, which are called the multitudes, that are identified with the materialism of Egypt, with Asia. And those are the ones that make the problem in the wilderness to Moses. Because they are identified with the left side. With the darkness. The people of Israel are holy. Meaning, the archetypes are the image of Yehida. So they are part of the light. 
But if we are not careful, as Azazel did it, could be bottled up when you become enamored in love with the daughters of Adam in the physical world. Remember that the Beni Elohim fell, as the Bible states. So in that process, we have to be careful because it's a long process of annihilation of the negative elements in us in order to gather Sabaoth, the army of Moses, in order to make one unity of it, which is perfection in mastery. One thing is to reach mastery in the fifth initiation, and another thing is to, perf to achieve perfection in mastery. Only Moses can do that. Council body, going there into the world of Yetzirah, and then to appear in the world of Bria, and continue to Atziluth, and then to submerge into the absolute as a Paramarta Satya. It's a long journey, the direct path, and only Moses can take it. You cannot take the direct path with the mental body or with the astral body. You need to create the causal body. The causal body is the one that takes the direct path. The causal body kneels before the burning bush, and the burning bush, which is the logos inside of you, says, Go down, I will be with you. You are dumb now, you cannot talk clearly, but Aaron, which is the archetype that symbolizes Elijah within you, will be your tongue. Aaron will read, will study the doctrines of my other messengers and give the doctrine through you to humanity. This is what Matthew Samael on the earth did. With his air on, his mind, study that. But that mind was under the command of Moses, because Moses is that element that controls the mind, controls Netzach. So Aaron, of course, was the one who was talking in front of the Pharaoh. You remember? Moses was behind him, and Aaron was saying what Moses was telling. That is our solar mind that has the capacity to, to study here in this physical world. That's why we said a Gnostic is somebody that study the doctrine of the great masters. Not reading Kalkian garbage like in this day and age, you find a lot of literature which is garbage. When I said secret, sacred doctrine, I'm talking about the Bible, the Quran, the Bhagavad Gita, the Mahabharata, the Popol Vuh, and many other books written by great initiates who had Moses within, in their own level. And for that, then you help humanity. Like in this moment, we are helping all of you, and we are talking about the book of Genesis. Why? Because you don't know anything about the Bhagavad Gita or Mahabharata, do you? When we're talking about Bible, you just say, oh, yeah, 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 because everybody here, we have millions of Christians. But I don't know if they are going to study this doctrine, right? So that's why we are delivering the doctrine through the Moses of the Bible written, because it's what they know. Unfortunately, when we talk about them, they just make the cross and conjure us. It says, you are from the devil. You, you, this is no good. So what can we do? At least there are few of you that know about the Bible, that will understand that the Bible is a message from the internal worlds, or as the people said, the Word of God. Do you have questions? Yeah? yeah? Yeah, that is the mantra of, uh, that belongs to Tifereth, the sixth dimension. Eloah, or Ella, Va, Da'at. If you meditate in those uh, mantras, which are Hebrew mantras, Ella, Va, Da'at, Yod, He, Vav, He, that will open the doors for you to penetrate with your consciousness, which is part of Tifereth. Because when we talk about the causal body, if we don't have Moses already developed, at least we have the essence, 
which is part of that. Because that part of Moses called essence is inside of each one of us. All of us, it, it depends. If we want to develop him, we have to transmute the waters. And then he will emerge as a crocodile. As a Levitanin. Well, uh, pronounce it as this is in, in, in Hebrew. Uh, if you uh, go into the internet, you will find dictionaries of Hebrew how to pronounce Elah. Elah is Aleph Lamed Hey, Elah, or Eloah, we say sometimes. That means the feminine aspect of God, masculine or feminine, of Elohim. Elah, Va, means and, that, knowledge. Eloah va dat acknowledge yod he vav he is a mantra of Tiferet. Yeah? Can you cabalistically explain Messiah, like the spelling and the Hebrew and the mathematics of it? The addition? Yeah. Mem, then Shin, then Yod. And het, this is how I remember that it's written. Let's say this word Messiah, Kabbalistically, what will we get of it? First, we said Mem, right? It's 40. Then the letter Shin, which is 300. Meshiah, the letter Yod, which is 10. And Chet, which is, Chet is eight, right? You see now my Aaron knows about that. <laughs> this is eight uh, uh, plus, uh, you make addition, how much you have there? 358. What? 358. 300. Okay, 358. I am following your, what you said. <laughs> which means 16. Which means 7. The synthesis. Right? 16, of course, the letter 16 is, is, is a letter Ayin. Which is the left side. And it's because the Messiah always descends to the left side. Into the world. The left side... Is that side that you have to work, that we have to work with. The left side is Hava. Eve. The waters work to the left. Ida. It's a lot of work to do there. With a 16. And the outcome of, if we purify that Ayin, which is a 16, is a fulmin fulminated tower in the Arcanum. But with a lot of work, you can put that tower straight, which is a spinal column, and to develop the seven chakras, the seven kundalinis, the 49 fires. And the only one that can do that is the Messiah, because he is the only one that is called the Savior. That Savior works in different levels. He's not a person that you think that somebody will come and save the whole nation, the whole world, just by believing in him. That people think, no. You have to work with the Messiah, which is Yehida, in different levels. The higher level that we are talking here is the level of Moses. When you reach the fifth initiation, and you take the direct path, and then an atom of Yehida descends in you. And then that is the light shining through the face of Moses. He's a Messiah. He's a Savior. That descended with him because he said, You will be the God to Aaron, but I will the God of you. So you see the Bodhisattva. The mind here explains things, but behind the mind is Moses, the causal body that receives the light of God, which is above which is the Messiah, united with Tifereth. So the Messiah 
ends in Tifereth and gives, delivers the knowledge in order to help humanity in different levels. Because that Messiah, remember, is born always as a child. If you are not careful, Herod can come and kill it. So that Messiah has to work from, from the very bottom to grow and to become a Jesus Christ. The gospel explains that. The Master Samuel explains that in many books. How to develop your own Messiah. But first you have to incarnate him. And for the, to, in order to incarnate the Messiah, you have to take the direct path. That level that we are talking about. In which he will come to you and straight your karma. Helping to pay your karma. Helping to annihilate your ego. In order to make one light. Because he is one light with Yehida. And to of you one light. And this is how you become children of God. Another question here? You, you elucidated the, uh, the crocodile and the Leviathan with Moses. Is that related to the Makara? And my, the, the kind of second thing I'm interested in is um, John all the Lord talks about the lizard being the degeneration mm -hmm. of the crocodile. Can you kind of explain that? Well, what is that? Uh, you said Makara? Refresh my mind because I don't. Um, I believe it's uh, from Tibetan Buddhism, the Makara, and it's related to Capricorn. Um, Blavatsky talks about it in Theosophy of Sweden. Yeah, it could be the Leviathan too, because you know this symbol that we are explaining here from the Bible is explained also in the in Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism, in Hinduism, in but in different ways, like the graphic that we were showing of Matsya, the first avatar of Vishnu, relates to the same meaning. Right? When you read that esoterically, of course. Now, of course, the crocodile is an evolving creature, physically speaking. That uh, is a symbol of Moses and also symbolizes Ruach, the spirit of God that moves upon the waters. That's also the crocodile among the Egypt, uh, Egyptians. It's called, called, uh, it's called the sacred crocodile Zebek which is Ruach with the two souls. Three weeks, he says, of light. Hesed, Gebura, and Tifereth. That's the meaning of the crocodile. That's why we call Tifereth, Moses, also a crocodile. That comes from the water, from Yesod. It's a crocodile. It's a Leviathan, in other words. A great master of Kabbalah. So the crocodile, of course, is an evolving creature, but the lizard, or we will say the... What is the name for the... It's a devolving creature. Alligator. alligator. It's devolving. Right? And it's because you find uh, different types also of creatures that come from the water and that talk about Kabbalah, talk about alchemy, but they are alligators. And they say that even the human being in this level come from the alligator. But the alligator is a devolving, means a, a creature, esoterically speaking, coming from fornication. While the crocodile is positive. So the opposite is the alligator. But anyhow, in esotericism in Egypt, we call those negative crocodiles demon with the face of a crocodile, which is an alligator. That's a, 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 the meaning of the crocodile. What is your question? Um, I see different hand and finger positions when meditating, different mudras. What would you recommend? And would you explain the meaning? Well, to explain the different meanings of mudras during meditation, this is a kind of uh, Hindu question, related with Hinduism, right? Where they adopt also in Buddhism different positions uh, with the hand, etc., in order to meditate. What I advise you is not to identify with the position of your hands or position with your body, but the position of your mind, the position of your consciousness when you are meditating. To concentrate and where you are concentrated and to comprehend what you need to comprehend with your spinal column straight and to if you like to perform any mudra with your hands this is just to close the the how you call the currents the electric currents of your body 
in order to make a unity of energy in, in you, this is what the mudras help to. But if you are doing that mudra physically and you are not doing that mentally or consciously, you are just wasting your time. There's a lot of people that you see that are in one position and having those mudras. And meanwhile, they're just uh, flying in the moon. <laughs> they are not concentrated. It is better to be concentrated and to do what you have to do with a mudra or without it. Question. Another question? To take the sandals off, uh, there's a question. When Moses goes, he says, take your sandals off. The sandals are, of course, the symbol of the physical body because the feet symbolizes Malkut. Take your sandals out because this is holy means don't come here to talk with me and bring your garbage from the physical world. Take it out naked and talk to me in purity. Because imagine that you are there in the causal body, and of course, that is the superior mind. You have your mind, your, your concrete mind, which is your intellect there. You have to take that out of you and to be only with the causal body, concentrated. That brings into my memory Maxis Amaelon Veor, when talking with the feminine aspect of God in front of her. And the Divine Mother is forgiving, is going to forgive her, uh, to forgive him, I mean, the karma. And he's kneeled be, uh, in front of uh, his Divine Mother, Ela, Eloa. And he says to his mother, Mother, forgive me my past karma because I annihilated a lot of egos and I am not capable of doing that evil more in the physical world. And then he says, not even for a million dollars I will do it. And then his divine mother look at him and says, my son, what is that about million dollars? Why are you talking like that? You see, he's telling him, take your sandals off your shoes. Don't bring that foul word here. And then he says, forgive me, mother. What happened is that in the physical world in which I live, which is illusory, this is how people talk. And then he says, I forgive you. Forget it. Now let us talk what we want to talk. And he continues. So that's an example precisely of the causal body being in front of God and talking baloney, you know, one million dollars. What, what do you have to talk with God about that? You have to talk with purity. Yeah? In the Bible, the people that Moses liberated complain about nearly everything. The liberated people represent the liberated consciousness, right? If so, why do they complain? Well, in the Bible, there is a complaining of people, yeah. But not the people that he liberated. It's the people that comes to him. Because during the Exodus, when you are going into the internal planes and doing your work, you bring a lot of elements, archetypes in you, which are bottled up into the multitudes that still are identified, as I said, with the negative aspect, with the left side, which is Egypt. And those are the people that complain. Because remember that they come to our, our own when, when Moses is in the in the in Sinai, in the mountain, talking to God, and then he says, "Let us make an Elohim here, different." Not that because that Moses left. We don't know who he is, or where he is, right? And then our own represents the right side. In order not to lose the archetypes, he follows the advices or what the people want that uh, are the three traders behind them, which is Abiram, uh, Kore, and the other one, Datan, which are inside of us. Remember this. If we ever reach the fifth initiation and take the direct path, Datan, Abiram, and Kore will come with us because are inside of us. 
and we have to annihilate them in the way. And many other problems. Take the direct path doesn't mean that uh, to collect the archetypes is easy. The multitude of egos that we have within, we have to annihilate, and they go with us. Or well, we encounter them in the wilderness. But the archetypes that are free, they have no problems. The archetypes that are bottled up into the ego are the ones that have problems. You have another question? Yeah. Well, how to address people in relation with this alchemy and Kabbalah has to be in a very systematic manner. Here, we are dropping an atomic bomb. <laughs> but because people need it, it's not only for you. This is recorded. It want to be in the Gnostic radio for people in the world that love the Bible, that love the Word of God in the Bible. So, those people that understand it, will explain to those that still do not understand. If you understand this better, then you will explain others that are in the very lower level, and you will help, and those other ones will help others. That's the way. Unfortunately, unfortunately, because the Bible is a book that is the bestseller. It's everywhere in different languages. But do the people understand it? No. Still they think. Believe in Jesus, and you don't believe in Jesus, you don't go to heaven. You are lost. You go to hell. Believing. And it's because they interpret and translate the Bible in a very wrong way. To believe in something is good. But to think that we are going to do it because of believing in that, I can believe here, of course, in many things. I, what I explain, I will understand. But if I don't do what I am explaining, I'm lost. I'm not saying, oh, I'm a savior. Oh, I've saved no, I am the process. The Lord is helping me and will help you as he's helping me. Everyone is on level. I was not born with this knowledge I am explaining right now. Developed through the work that I am doing. But I understand that this is individual. And unfortunately, there is a lot of people there that do not have the understanding of this work. They think that just by memorizing the Bible, it is done or any other book, just by knowing Kabbalah is how it is done. I heard in, in the website or in the internet, Kabbalists that know about this, and they said, if you want to be saved, you have to study Kabbalah, and they said, study it. No, you have to practice, not only study it. You have another question? Okay, do you have another question? Yes? Oh yeah, that's a good, good suggestion. If you want to learn uh, basic things, uh, watch operas of the great masters because there are psychological messages. For instance, Verdi. How many messages there that you have to understand in your, in your own psyche? But higher messages like Mozart in the Magic Flute or Wagner and the uh, Ring of the Nibelungen or Parsifal, which is very high. But you have to begin with lower operas that will help you to understand because that goes not only to your intellect, but to your heart, which is the emotional center. Why would Jesus, uh, call, why would you call him Emmanuel? Is there a difference with the name Emmanuel? Well, Emmanuel means the God with us. That's the translation of that name. In Hebrew, Emmanuel, you see. And of course, from that uh, comes the word or the name Manuel, right? From Emmanuel, right? The, 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 the God with us. And uh, it is because when you receive for the first time the incarnation of the Messiah, God is with you, but as a baby. That is Emmanuel, the first manifestation of Yehida within the initiate. 
It needs to grow. But you see that Moses showed it very clear in the Exodus. He begins dealing with the Pharaoh and etc., etc., as we explain in all the lectures, and develops that Messiah inside of him in different levels until finally reaching uh, his death, complete death. Yeah, the same uh, word, Manuel, Manas, yeah, it's come from mind, of course. Superior mind, we will say. Because all the languages have the root in the golden language. So, by studying the different uh, languages, you understand that all of them come from the same root. Thank you very much. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah,